phenomenal event. This is in celebration of Black History Month. We are collaborating with the Plant-Based Nutrition and Sustainable Ag Certificate Program, Nutrition and Foods, and Black History Month in order to bring you a, I'm so excited, I have goosebumps everywhere, a wonderful speaker. I have been working on this for two years go and counting, and finally the day has come. A well-fed world has generously given money to bring Dr. Milton Mills out from Washington, D.C. As you saw, yes. As you saw in the trailer of The Invisible Vegan, which is available on Vimeo, we thought we were gonna have it last year. I had the recital hall booked, everything was ready, and the movie wasn't ready. So it finally came out on MLK this past January, and it's now available on Vimeo. But Dr. Mills has been in many movies. Who has seen What the Health? Okay, Forks Over Knives. All right, see, these are my people. All right. <laughs> So Dr. Mills actually lives in Washington, D.C. However, he was born in Oakland. So, yes, he is one of our hometown people. And he went to Stanford University Medical School. He works, and then he did his residency at Georgetown, correct? All right. And then he works um, right now in Washington, D.C. He does some work in Alexandria still. And so he sees patients. He doesn't have a website. He works on, with patients, patients, patients. I have to call him after eight o'clock Eastern time just to talk to him because he's so busy. So he took time out of his life to come here to speak to you. And it is with much admiration and respect and honor that I turn the floor over to Dr. Milton Mills. Uh, thank you very much, Tim Maria. It was a very kind and wonderful introduction, and thank you guys for uh, inviting me. Um, this morning's lecture um, is going to be kind of a, a Rorschach test of sorts, meaning that we're going to look at some common things, but what we see uh, will depend on um, our frame of reference. So um, how many of you share your life with uh, pets, companion animals? Okay. Well, you know, many of us, we have dogs, we have cats, and we love those animals, and for us, they're even family members. But in certain parts of the world, people look at those animals and they see something to eat, which fills a lot of us with horror. But materially uh, and, and truly, um, there isn't... Uh, any substantial difference between a dog or a cat or a cow. Um, it just depends on your frame of reference. And so, whereas we look at our dogs and our cats and we see family members, but some of us look at, you know, cows and chickens and we think of them as food, the fact is that they're sentient, feeling, uh, aware beings in every way that our companions anim animals are. It's just that we have been taught to look at them a certain way. And um, I hope that by the end of this lecture, our frame of reference will have changed and we will uh, reevaluate what we think of as food. So uh, today we're going to try to cover a lot of ground and we're going to uh, uh, focus on some of the um, uh, cultural, societal, and historical factors that come into play um, and that impact the health profiles that we see in the African American communities and other communities of color. And you can't look at where these communities are with respect to their um, aggregate health profiles without looking at the historical context um, uh, that these uh, communities have developed in because the uh, institutional and societal racism that the communities have often had to confront and uh, continue to deal with have a direct impact on the health uh, and wellness of the people existing uh, in those communities. And you will see that 
societal and cultural traumas echo and reverberate all the way down through history and continue to do so uh, to this day and affect um, how we see ourselves um, and how we relate to one another and to the food that we eat and uh, consequently how that food uh, impacts our health. So, uh, so what, what am I talking about? How is it that racism or societal racism uh, impacts um, uh, the health profile of a community? Well, when you look at how America has dealt with um, uh, uh, minority populations, there has been a recurring pattern that um, has played out over and over and over again. And uh, it's um, most obvious in the uh, uh, situation of looking at African Americans, but it's also fairly obvious when you look at how um, our government has dealt with Native American populations, and it's also playing out in how we deal with um, Hispanic uh, uh, groups down to this day by um, deeming them illegals and not allowing them a safe place in our society which keeps them marginalized and therefore in uh, positions of economic and um, uh, uh, social and and even nutrition nutritional insecurity. So um, when you look at, for instance, what happened with African Americans, um, African Americans were originally Africans <laughs> and uh, living in Africa where they were captured. So they were taken from a place where they had their own culture. They were able to um, live within an environment to which they had uh, become both acculturated and accustomed to. They had developed uh, food support mechanisms uh, and were fully self-sustaining, brought to America and confined on um, what we sort of euphemistically call plantations, but in, in fact they were um, slave labor camps. And um, we really need to kind of rethink that because, you know, the, the term plantation conjures images of beautiful uh, uh, mansions with pillars and magnolia trees and people uh, sipping mint juleps and, uh, you know, sort of happy slaves out in the field singing Camp Town Races. But in fact, uh, these were uh, brutal slaver labor camps where people were worked to death, brutalized, women were routinely raped, um, and actually uh, men were raped as well. Um, um, both for pleasure and as a way of subjugating them into uh, bending to uh, the master's will, families were not allowed to exist in the uh, um, kind of traditional permanent sense that, that we think of family today, um, both because, again, by uh, keeping the uh, social uh, uh, structure um, uh, insecure and fluid, it made the individuals easier to control. Now, I'm not saying that they were completely controlled or quote unquote easy, but it made it easier. Um, it's certainly uh, less difficult to deal with people when they don't have support or some good support systems than when they do. And so um, we see that slaves were, I mean, that the Africans were brought over here, confined to these slave labor camps, and uh, um, take, so they were taken from a place where they were food secure. If you guys want to find seats, come on. You're not going to bother me. Um, where they were food secure, um, they had developed um, uh, a culture that allowed them to grow food. And it's very interesting because when we think of slavery, we frequently think of um, the uh, aspects of cotton because um, as uh, slavery sort of developed in this country, cotton became the predominant cash crop um, uh, towards the, the close of, of slavery in the United States. But it didn't start out that way. It turned out that as slavery began to develop in the United States, the initial uh, cash crops were uh, rice, 
and tobacco. And in fact, some of the first large plantations were in the, along the Carolina coast, where the land was very swampy. It was not good for growing anything uh, like cotton, but it was very good for growing rice. And so um, some of the first slaves that were targeted, or some of the first African nations that were targeted for um, the people that lived there were coastal African nations because the people that lived there had the techniques to grow rice because rice has to be grown on swampy land. It, it, it needs water to grow properly. And so they were uh, brought over uh, for that purpose. And um, have any of you been to the African American Museum in uh, Washington, D.C.? Um, I would encourage all of you to, to go um, if and when you get a chance because it is an incredible, first of all, it's just an incredible museum, but it is uh, an amazing educational experience. Now. Most of you are thinking, wow, yeah, but man, it's hard to get in there because you got to order tickets in advance and da-da-da-da, right? Here's a dirty little secret. If you are uh, in D.C. and you go to the museum by 11.30 every morning, if you're in line by 11.30, they hand out same-day tickets between 11.30 and 12.30. And if you're in line by 11.30, you will get same-day tickets. So don't worry about ordering tickets in advance. Just be in line by 11.30 and you can get into the museum. But um, the reason I, I'm encouraging you to do that is because one of the things that the uh, museum does very, very effectively and thoroughly is it traced the history of not only how slavery changed and evolved in the United States, but how the culture of our country evolved to uh, justify and support both the changes to slavery and the abuses uh, that were inherent within it. And so what you find is that very early in the colonial period, when um, the colonies were still under British rule, uh, the first Africans that were brought he over here um, were actually not that different from uh, indentured servants. And while my knucklehead, I actually live in Virginia, just outside DC, and um, the knucklehead governor who seems to think that um, black people have the skin color of shoe polish um, <laughs> compared slaves to indentured servants, he, there was a kernel of truth to that because very early in the colonial period, the first uh, Africans who were brought here as slaves actually were treated uh, closer to uh, indentured servants and could uh, eventually work their way out of slavery and also um, uh, uh, accumulate money and purchase the uh, freedom of, of family members and loved ones. But as the plantation system started to, to uh, develop and these um, wealthy planters started making a lot of money, again, initially with rice and tobacco, the need for labor skyrocketed. And as a result, they then began to uh, put in place something called slave codes. And what the slave code stipulated was that uh, Africans were not genetically equivalent to uh, Europeans, that we were somewhat less than human, and therefore it was uh, legal to keep us in a, um, a situation of perpetual bondage. Um, and so that's how uh, uh, this was codified into law. And uh, so you have slaves then being confined to these uh, uh, slave labor camps. And instead of being allowed to eat the healthy plant-based diets that they were used to, they were fed the garbage of the plantations. Because again, um, on the plantation system, it's all about maximizing profits. So you don't feed your, um, uh, force la your labor force the uh, expensive food that you guys eat um, in the mansion, you feed them the cast off and the garbage. And so that's where the um, practice of eating things like pig's feet, pig's ears, chitlins, chicken feet, and the refuse that was normally thrown away was then given to the slaves to make food out of. Even some of the foods that we, re we now recognize as being healthy, such as collard greens and okra and so forth, were originally, th their collard greens are actually weeds. 
um, and um, they're every bit as a, a, a quote unquote weed as like dandelions. We consider dandelions weed, but we also know that dandelion greens some of the healthiest things you can eat. And so the uh, slaves were literally forced to eat what were considered marginal foods. Um, so you have people taken from a situation of economic security and uh, uh, food security, put in a situation of dependency, and then force-fed uh, garbage. Well, slavery, um, up until 1808, it was legal to import slaves from Africa directly. Then um, a law was passed that said it was no longer legal to bring in uh, slaves from outside the country. And that then caused the um, uh, practice of slavery within the United States to undergo a fundamental change. It went from the international slave trade to the domestic slave trade. And that was important because prior to 1808, actually slave families could remain relatively intact because if the uh, planters needed uh, uh, more, more laborers, they simply went uh, down and hired uh, new slaves. But since it was now no longer legal to bring in uh, slaves from uh, Africa, they had to breed them. And so what happened uh, with the uh, evolution of the domestic slave trade is that you find that the large uh, sort of uh, uh, northern, uh, uh, they're not really, I want to say northern southern plantations in Maryland and Virginia became breeder um, uh, uh, plantations where they actually began purposely breeding African Americans for sale. And uh, that's when you started to see the uh, severe disruption of the uh, 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 African American families. Now, everybody has heard the expression of, you know, boy, so and so got sold down the river, right? That is an expression that comes from the domestic slave trade. Because literally, when um, uh, these kids became of age, the planter would take them and sell them down the river to the large plantations down south. Uh, you've heard of people being run out of town on a rail. Again, that also comes from this uh, policy of sending people south uh, via the railroad. And um, what was very uh, kind of shocking and telling to me as I'm going through the, uh, the uh, museum was once the uh, um, American slavery evolved into the domestic slave trade, women became extremely valuable while men became expendable. And that's very similar to what we do to the animals that we exploit. Have you ever thought about the fact that we exploit the females and the males are just either um, destroyed at birth um, or um, used um, uh, you know, just killed for uh, uh, the, the smallest reason. So, like for instance, chickens. Chickens, baby chickens at, in the hatchery are sexed, meaning that their, their sex is determined while after, right after hatching. The uh, female chickens are saved for uh, either um, use as egg layers or um, for growth as uh, uh, broiler hens. And the um, male chickens are put through a grinder where they're ground up for pet food. A um, similar thing happens with um, uh, 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 the uh, cattle production. The uh, 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 female cows are, have to be kept pregnant so that they will give milk, but their, their calves are taken away as soon as they're born. The female calves are raised on an artificial, um, uh, I don't even want to call it formula. It's actually uh, this uh, concoction of blood and, and some other uh, ingredients to help them grow, whereas the males are immediately sold for veal. Um, so the women are valuable, the males are expendable. And um, uh, again, something very, very, like I said, analogous happened during the slave trade. But this then impacts what happened to Native Americans because uh, 
if you look at Hollywood uh, films, the impression is that Native American populations in this country were primarily riding around on horses shooting buffalo. But the fact of the matter is that, by, that the vast majority of uh, Native American populations were actually agricultural uh, and agrarian uh, communities where they raised crops uh, to provide the food that they needed. And in fact, another wonderful museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C. is the Native American Museum. And um, very famously, Native Americans were uh, um, produced what were called the Four Sisters, which were corn, beans, squash. Tim Marie, what's, what's the fourth one? Corns, beans, squash, and there's one more. Three, three sisters, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, the beans helped fertilize the soil. The squash helped, uh, would uh, keep down... Um, uh, the uh, uh, weeds, and of course the corn produced grain. And as it happened, um, in the uh, American uh, uh, Southeast, the Cherokee, um, uh, uh, Choctaw, and uh, Muscogee, and Seminole uh, uh, tribes had actually cleared out the land that we now think of as Georgia, Alabama, uh, the panhandle of Florida, and we're cultivating that land. Well, uh, again, in the early 1800s, um, the cotton gin was invented, and it suddenly became possible to de-seed cotton very cheaply, and cotton became the cash crop. Well, at that point, that's when the huge deep south cotton plantations sprang up. But again, there was a humongous need for labor. And um, the, well, both land and labor. And the land came from the Native American populations. How many of you have heard of the Trail of Tears? The Trail of Tears was the forced uh, march of, these, of the Cherokee, Choctaw, and these other Indian nations from land that they, were, they had already cleared and were cultivating out to what was considered marginal land in Oklahoma where they were confined to reservations. And the reason that was done was not because these people were violent savages, you know, killing, you know, um, the lovely settlers. It was because the American government wanted that land to raise cotton. So again, the, the uh, fate of Native Americans is tied intimately with what happened to African Americans. The Indians were, the Native Americans, excuse me, were forced off their land so that uh, uh, planters could take that land and start to grow cotton. And again, they're importing um, uh, African Americans from the North to uh, work as slaves uh, on this land. So you, again, have the similar pattern um, uh, 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 playing out. You have people who had their own indigenous culture. They were food secure because they were raising food on land that they had cleared and were cultivating. And suddenly they were forced off that land, uh, put in a situation of food insecurity because they were deliberately put on land that was uh, difficult or impossible to farm so that they would be dependent on government rations and handouts. Because basically, when you can't find uh, food for yourself or your family or your children, you tend to be very cooperative with the people who actually have the food. And that's, it's, and that's, just, and that's what happened, uh, again, with a Native American population. So then you look at, well, what kind of food were they given by the government? And here again, you find, uh, again, a recurring pattern and theme, and that is that the government then... <laughs> Um, uses these confined populations to um, sell commodity uh, leftover crops to. So you have excess uh, 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 um, grain production that's been turned into flour, um, sugar, um, milk, um, uh, meats that have been canned, salted, and essentially turned into very unhealthy commodities stored in uh, warehouses, but then the people that own this stuff sell it to the government who then turns around and gives it to these food insecure populations. And when people eat this stuff, it creates disease. Is that clear? And again, I, I, you know, I could, 
I, I'm sort of giving you sort of the compressed Reader's Digest version of this um, because I have a lot more than I need to cover today. But this is a recurring pattern. And again, um, you know, we, we, we call the uh, um, uh, people of Hispanic origin um, uh, undocumented. Um, uh, the less politically correct term is they're called illegals. But the fact of the matter is that Hispanic people were here when all of us got here. Um, and um, as the United States was incorporated, they were sort of forced um, uh, south. But the fact is that they've always been here. And uh, to keep them in a permanently uh, undocumented status plays into the hands, again, of the wealthy elite. Because I ask you, <laughs> we have satellites that can watch a Russian soldier light a cigarette somewhere in Siberia. If we really wanted to stop people coming across that damn border, we would do it, number one. Number two, statistics show that more than twice as many com people come across our northern border as come across the southern border. Why are we concerned about the southern border? It has something to do with the color of the people's skin who come across that border. But the fact of the matter is that they are allowed to come across because they create cheap labor. Um, if you um, go to the uh, food packing, uh, the meat packing plants, you see that they are predominantly staffed by uh, Hispanic Im immigrants. Um, we all know that um, our crops are picked uh, by um, uh, again, Hispanic immigrants, you go to any of the major hotels and uh, the uh, uh, housekeeping staff, largely Hispanic immigrants. Again, if we really wanted to keep these people out of the country, we would be uh, prosecuting the people who are hiring them. Uh, this is just all a, a big political ploy, but what it does do by not allowing people to obtain quote unquote documented or legal status is it keeps them in a position of economic and social insecurity. And that means that they are then uh, frequently forced into situations of dependency and uh, will uh, have to rely on uh, uh, government programs. Uh, when it comes to government food assistance programs, um, does anybody know which was the very first government food assistant pro assistance program that was created uh, in the uh, 20th century? Was it food stamps? Was it uh, WIC? Was it uh, uh, Medicare? What do you guys think? Food stamps, right? No. The very first government food assistance program was actually the school lunch program. And the school lunch program was created not because the government was concerned about the welfare of children. Um, right after World War II, the United States had so massively ramped up food production because remember, we're fighting a truly international world war, two ocean war. We've got uh, this giant army. We're feeding not just our army, but you know, Britain, Russia, and, and some other countries that suddenly the war comes to an end and we're still producing huge amounts of food. So the farmers and agricultural producers began to lobby the government and said, you know, if we don't find something to do, someplace to sell this food, price is gonna drop, the economy is gonna tank, and we're gonna have another depression on our hand. So the food, uh, the uh, uh, school lunch program was created as a way of purchasing government surplus food production. And by the way, I want you guys to assume that I'm Sarah Sanders and everything I'm telling you is a lie. Um, and go home and Google all these things for yourself, okay? And you'll see that this is all true. Um, so again, we see the similar pattern that the uh, uh, government assistance, the food support programs were created as a way of essentially using a captive audience, in this case school children, to allow somebody else to make money. And what did they feed these kids? Were they feeding them fruits and vegetables and whole grains? No, they're feeding them crap. 
<laughs> you know, cheese and, and, and canned meat and uh, to whatever vegetables they got, they were canned vegetables and, and milk because every single uh, school lunch has to have a carton of milk. Even though the government has known for a number of years that the vast majority of Americans of color cannot digest milk. Uh, and even for people who can't digest it, they shouldn't be drinking it because it's very unhealthy. So, uh, again, uh, we see this similar pattern where captive populations were exploited um, for uh, economic, the economic gain of, of producers. So, um, with that, I'm going to switch gears and start to talk about the uh, impact of what we eat on our actual health. Okay? So, today's lecture is called... Uh, entitled Diets and Health. And we're going to talk about moving away from the standard American diet or the SAD diet to food that is actually good for our body and soul. I like to start all my lectures off with a quote from the Bible. This is from the book of Genesis. God told uh, Adam and Eve, you shall eat the plants of the field. That was good advice then, and it's good advice now. It's Genesis 3.18. So, it's good advice because, in fact, um, Genesis tells us that basically God designed humans to be uh, plant eaters. Uh, Daniel chapter 1 uh, very famously tells us that Daniel and his companions refused to eat the uh, meat-containing diet of the, of the uh, Babylonians and requested instead to be allowed to eat a purely plant-based diet. At the end of 10 days, they were found to be healthier, to have uh, better mental clarity than the people who ate the king's meat, uh, the, king, uh, the standard diet. Modern research actually confirms that plant-based diets are healthier because they promote promote better mental and physical health, and also decrease chronic disease and help us live longer, more active, and fully functional lives. The Adventist health study showed that vegetarian uh, Adventist men live almost 10 years longer than the average population. That's an average, meaning many of them live much longer, and uh, women live about six and a half years longer. That does not mean being plant-based is better for men than it is women. It's just that, ladies, you guys already live so much longer than we do, there's less room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this study also showed that the uh, plant-based Adventists had less cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, how many of you have heard of Blue Zones? All right. For those of you who do not know what a Blue Zone is, Blue Zones are the areas around the world where people live the longest and have the lowest risk for chronic disease and dementia. And there is only one Blue Zone in the United States uh, that has been identified, and that is in Loma Linda, California, where Seventh-day Adventists live, and that's because so many of them are uh, plant-based. And that is the one thing that the Blue Zones have in common, is that the populations in the Blue Zones around the world eat a largely or entirely plant-based diet. So, again, I touched on this earlier. Uh, what is uh, soul food? What do we, what we call stu uh, soul food? Well, studies show that the diets of African Americans are comparable to standard Western diets in composition in terms of total calories, uh, percentage calories from fat, protein, and so forth. However, because of thrifty gene complexes, Western style diets actually cause higher rates of disease in African Americans and other ethnic and racial minorities. So what you see is a slide comparing uh, what can be considered pre-diabetes or glucose intolerance and actual diabetes in uh, black people living in West Africa, in the yellow, and in the United States and Great Britain. And the thing that just jumps off the uh, chart at you is that both prediabetes and actual diabetes are far more prevalent in the U.S. and Great Britain than they are in West Africa. Why is that? It's because in West Africa, where people are continuing to eat a largely plant-based diet, they don't prom these diets don't promote excess disease. But when uh, blacks, either because of 
uh, forced or uh, uh, um, elective migration, move to Western countries and adopt a Western-style diet, you can see that the rates of disease skyrocket uh, and, and go off the chart. Now, so-called soul food is peculiar to the African-American community, typically includes things like chitlins, oxtails, neck bones, pig's feet, and other high-fat, high-salt, and sugar-laden foods. And um, as I mentioned to you before, these are foods people were forced to eat on the uh, plantation. Um, and by the way, I was talking to one of my patients once about um, having, trying to have a more uh, a healthier, lower-fat, plant-based diet, and I was suggesting that he try to incorporate you know, pasta uh, uh, into his diet. He said, oh, Doc, I, I, I eat pasta. I eat macaroni and cheese. <laughs> And I said, well, um, you know, um, macaroni and cheese is not a low-fat food because um, cheddar cheese is about 75% fat and around 65% of that fat is saturated fat. He's like, oh, that's okay, Doc. I put a little vinegar on it and that cuts the fat. I'm like, no, nah, that just gives you vinegar-flavored fat. Doesn't cut a thing. <laughs> so... Um, the REGARDS, which stands for Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke Study, examined the relationship between diet and stroke in over 30,000 Americans, black and white, who were 40, 45 years of age or older, and showed that most of the increased stroke risks we see in African Americans can be explained by differences in diet. It showed that the Southern-style diet, which featured heavy consumption of fried foods, organ meats, processed meats, full-fat milk, sugar-sweetened uh, uh, beverages, while limiting intake of fruit, salads, and whole grains, increased stroke risk by a whopping 63%, whereas the plant-based pattern, which had more cruciferous vegetables, green leafy vegetables, fruits, beans, and whole grains, not completely vegetarian, but just proportionally more plant foods, decreased stroke risk by 20%, and if they had been fully plant-based, it would have decreased it even more so. All food is made up of chemicals, some of them good, some of them bad. We have to remember to maximize the uh, good ones and leave the bad ones alone. And so this brings up uh, what I like to call plantation food. West Africans who were brought to America were literally forced to eat the garbage of the plantations that they were confined to. And yes, they showed ingenuity and resolve and did their best to transform this refuse into acceptable food. But unfortunately, once slavery ended, instead of leaving this uh, garbage on the plantation, many of us brought it with us and christened it soul food. It is not soul food. It is health-destroying plantation food, and it's not our true heritage. So we need to leave it alone. So is this only bad for uh, uh, people of color? And the answer is no. And this is a comparative anatomy chart to try and quickly demonstrate that human beings are not carnivores, clearly, but we're not even omnivores. Uh, because an omnivore is an animal that is designed to eat both plant and animal foods. And as you can see, when you look at this chart, um, there are profound differences between carnivores and omnivores um, and the uh, plant eaters and humans. You can see that humans essentially have all of the anatomical features that are consistent with a committed plant-based diet from uh, the way our jaws are made and the way our jaws operate to uh, our teeth, uh, our incisors, the way that we uh, chew our food. Carnivores and omnivores don't really chew, they just uh, either uh, crush uh, their food and swallow it or they just swallow it whole. We have enzymes in our saliva, the, the carnivores and omnivores don't. Um, we have um, a stomach that uh, will only hold about 25% of our uh, gut capacity, meaning that we have to eat multiple times every single day in order to get enough calories to last one day. Have you um, ever thought about the fact that in the wild, carnivores are uh, only successful when they hunt about once every seven to 10 days. So if they only make a kill once every 10 days, how is it that they avoid starving to death? The fact is, the way they avoid starving to death is that they have gigantic stomachs. The stomach on a carnivore can hold 30% of its body weight. 
So that means that a 300-pound lioness can eat 100 pounds of meat at one meal. That's enough food to um, replace all of the calories she wasted chasing things she never caught and also last her until she catches something else. Furthermore, because carnivores can eat rotting tissue, they can actually extract additional energy from a dead carcass that um, uh, an herbivore can't because we don't have the stomach acid or the uh, immune system to kill the pathogens associated with, uh, with that type of diet. But all plant eaters have to eat multiple times every day just to get enough calories to last one day. And that's because plant food has a lot of fiber in it, and the fiber takes up a lot of space and has to be uh, processed in order to extract uh, um, the uh, energy that's in it. Uh, carnivores have very str uh, short, uh, small intestines. Uh, the uh, plant eaters have very, very long, small intestines. In uh, your uh, classic uh, uh, plant eater, the small intestine tends to be 10 to 12 times body length. And um, if, if I, if there's a, let's see, I'm sure there's a guy in here who's at least six feet tall. And if I were to cut you open and take out your small intestine and stretch it across the room, it would be um, 30 to 35 feet in length. So now I said that in the plant eaters, the small intestine is 10 times, 10 to 12 times body length, right? So if a six-foot man has a, just to use a round number, a 30-foot small intestine, does that meet the appropriate proportions for a plant eater? It's a trick question, so don't answer. <laughs> the answer is yes, because body length is not measured head to toe, it's measured head to tailbone. And torso length in humans is two and a half to three feet. So again, we have the classic proportions of a plant eater. Uh, and then again, our colon has the pouch structure found in uh, other uh, herbivores. We have an appendix. An appendix is only found in plant eaters. It's part of the uh, intestinal uh, immune system. And there's other physiologic changes uh, or differences. So uh, here's just a, a chart showing some of the same thing, but it shows the differences in uh, jaw structure and in the teeth. And I don't think there's anybody in here that has a set of teeth that looks like the first two pictures here. And if you do, I need to see you after this lecture. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing that's really uh, classic for the plant eaters is that they have a very small uh, opening into their oral cavity because they have to have well-developed facial muscles to help them chew up their food. But that also allows them to do something that carnivores can't. When carnivores drink liquids, how do they do it? They have to lap it up because they can't create a vacuum because they don't have the facial muscles. But the herbivores are able to suck up water because of the small mouth opening, we can create a vacuum and suck water into our mouth. So the fact that you can use a straw is because you're a plant eater. And I know you thought that your lips were for kissing. That's a fringe benefit. It's really to help you eat lettuce and spaghetti. All right. Well... The largest, most destructive epidemic of addiction we see in the country is really not due to, uh, as bad as it is, opiates or alcohol or even crack or meth, is actually our addiction to the unhealthy foods that we eat, the uh, destructive effects of what is a truly national eating disorder. It's reflected in the uh, off-the-chart rates of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, stroke, depression, anxiety, uh, and other chronic ailments that we see. It's, for instance, with respect to diabetes, it's estimated that the number of Americans diagnosed with diabetes has increased by more than 80% over the last 10 to 20 years alone. And this avalanche of diabetes and chronic disease is, has clearly affected people of all races and has been fueled in part by what I consider to be corruption and homogenization of American eating habits by giant fast and snack food corporations. So up top, you see a picture of a gas station. Why? Because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you went to the gas station to get gas. Now you can go get gas and a hot dog that's older than you are. Um, you can you can't get into Walmart without walking past McDonald's. 
Um, and as you can see from the bottom, uh, this addiction to these fast and unhealthy foods is causing spiraling, spiraling rates of obesity in our children. So we, and we see uh, uh, the fact that these fast food restaurants are targeted to communities of color. Uh, where these foods are subsidized so that they are very low in price and therefore accessible. Um, and again, this is another way that moneyed classes uh, uh, use the uh, uh, um, poorer populations uh, for profit. Uh, and they're aided by our tax dollars because we all know that you can go into a wealthy neighborhood and you will never see a McDonald's, a Wendy's, a KFC, or Popeye's. But it's driving through any inner city uh, community, it's like murderous row. You, it's just they're lined up. Um, and again, uh, these foods are sold at below market rates because uh, the cost of production is subsidized by the government. And the damaging and destructive effects of these uh, chronic diseases are, of course, amplified in communities of color uh, and among uh, racial and ethnic minorities because these diseases reach disproportionate levels and cause complication and complications and premature death rates that are well above the national average. So, for instance, an African American diagnosed with diabetes is over 240 times more likely to end up with a limb amputation, over a hundred times more likely uh, to end up uh, with kidney failure and on dialysis or to end up with uh, retinal damage that leads to blindness than Caucasian Americans. And um, this has a devastating impact uh, economically because whereas uh, uh, a family that had been struggling to sort of lift themselves out of uh, poverty suddenly finds themselves plunge right back into poverty because these diseases frequently strike the primary wage earner. And so instead of being able to use money to you know, move to a better neighborhood, get the kids in better schools, uh, now all of the money goes into buying medicines for you know, um, the sickest member of the family. And this is just to show you um, the differences between what people died from, um, uh, but, uh, looking at uh, 1880 versus 1997. Now, this uh, data is uh, taken from England and Wales, and it's because, interestingly, in the United States, we really didn't start keeping good public health records until the 20th century. But um, the uh, uh, disease rates were very, very similar. And what you see is that back in the late uh, 19th century, cancer and heart disease um, uh, which are the magenta and blue, accounted for a very small percentage of, uh, of deaths. And the primary reason for that is because people were still eating a largely plant-based diet. Uh, and that was true in the United States up until around mid-century. Um, how many of you, um, uh, what is, let me ask you, what does your grandparents, or what did your grandparents call the refrigerator? Icebox. Why do they call it an icebox? Because that's what they used to have growing up, was a box that the ice man would bring a big block of ice and you'd put it in there and it would keep things cool but not cold. And so when you're using an icebox, you can't store huge amounts of meat because it will rot. You can't even store huge amounts of dairy food because you can't keep it cold enough. And so prior to the, um, uh, um, uh, basically, the country being electrified, which happened after the Great Depression with the Tennessee Valley uh, Authority when FDR essentially um, had uh, electricity uh, brought to uh, the middle of the country and to uh, uh, the outlying areas, people didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have the ability to keep animal tissue uh, safe and, and, and cold. And furthermore, we didn't have the production of, of these animal foods like we do now. Uh, because uh, it was just simply too expensive. All of this happened both in terms of the uh, um, uh, uh, elect electricity being distributed to the entire country right before the war, but then because of the war, food production was ramped up to a degree that after the war, suddenly these foods that only wealthy people could afford all the time, I mean, people would have, you know, a chicken dinner on a special occasion or, you know, a steak or something, again, on a special occasion, but not every day. Suddenly, these foods were now widely available. And that's when you have um, 
uh, this uh, 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 invention of fast food restaurants. When was McDonald's in, uh, founded? 1950s. And the rest of these, you know, KFC, Burger King, uh, all these places came into being after that. Because again, it was only in the post-war period where we began producing animal foods to the degree that we could have fast food uh, widely available. And that is being reflected in disease rates. We're now finding that um, uh, average life expectancy is actually falling for the first time in over uh, 100 years. Um, and that's because people are starting to get things like colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and other uh, disease-related cancers at much younger ages than uh, our parents and grandparents, and it's because we're eating so much more animal food. Uh, this is uh, taken from uh, the uh, heart uh, uh, American Heart Association. This looks at heart uh, disease and stroke statistics, and you can see that in terms of national prevalence, um, the uh, African Americans have higher rates than anyone, and again, it's because uh, we're less adapted. Um, uh, Hispanic Americans and Caucasian Americans uh, um, have roughly similar rates. Um, although Hispanic women are slightly higher, uh, but the bottom line is these diets aren't good for anyone. Uh, so what is a heart attack? In fact, heart attacks are not sudden events. They take years to develop. The first uh, step in this process is an entry to um, the lining of your uh, 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 coronary artery of the blood vessel supplying blood to the heart. That entry is frequently uh, caused by something called TAMO, which is an oxidized um, compound that comes from a protein in meat or animal tissue uh, that then gets into the bloodstream, injures the artery, and then you have, start to have the deposition of fat and cholesterol at the site of that injury, which over time ultimately causes a blockage to build up. And that blockage will eventually get so big that it almost uh, occludes or blocks the entire um, um, artery. And um, everybody has watered uh, the garden or the grass, right? What happens when you put your thumb over the uh, uh, nozzle uh, in a uh, water hose? The water starts shooting out much faster and under greater force, correct? Well, the same thing happens as your blood tries to flow across this blockage. It has to speed up. It starts to uh, exert greater force. And what happens then is it creates what are called shear forces across that blockage, which can peel that layer, that top layer of cells off. And once that happens, the body treats that like any other injury. It says, I've got to form a blood clot. It's just that if you peel a uh, piece of skin off your, uh, your hand, your body will form a blood clot there. And if it forms a blood clot right at the site of that narrowing, you can get a complete block, uh, uh, blockage of blood flow in that artery. That's why aspirin is recommended um, for uh, helping to prevent a heart attack because aspirin uh, uh, helps prevent blood from clotting as quickly. Is that clear? So this is important because number one, people often say aspirin fights heart disease. No, it doesn't. Aspirin stops the terminal event in heart disease, but it doesn't do anything about that underlying blockage that is formed. Is that clear to everybody? And let me just take a moment to do another little PSA here. If you are ever in a situation, be it at home or out, and somebody suddenly clutches their chest, passes out, first thing you need to do is check for a pulse. If you don't feel a pulse, Obviously, you call 911, but you need to begin immediate CPR. Please do not wait for uh, EMTs to arrive, because if you do, by the time they get there, your loved one will likely be brain dead, okay? Um, it takes two minutes, and they will have permanent brain injury. And I'm telling you, I've seen this too many times in the emergency room. Someone is brought in. We ask what happened. They're like, oh, they were, you know, Sitting down watching TV, all of a sudden they killed over. We called 911, but you know, took them five, ten minutes to get there. So please, if somebody 
uh, passes out or goes down and they don't have a pulse, do CPR until the emergency medicine technicians arrive. And I don't, um, it's always best to take a, um, uh, a BLS or basic life support class, but even if you don't have one, do your best. And essentially, don't do it like they do on TV, you know, where they kind of stand from across the bed and just do this. No. You need to get over that person, put your hand on the left side of their chest, and push in until you deflect the chest wall at least an inch or two. Okay? Is that clear to everybody? All right. Don't wait for the emergency folks. And believe me, you will save lives. All right, epidemiology show that population consuming plant-based diet at much lower risk for developing heart disease, healthy plant-based diet, benefit our hearts in a number of ways by being low in total unsaturated fat and high in the heart healthy fats like polyunsaturated oils and monounsaturated oils. Uh, uh, plant-based diets contain, uh, if they're vegan, contain absolutely no cholesterol at all and no trans fat. Uh, vegetarian vegans have cardiovascular risk profiles that are well below those of people eating meat. They live longer, have lower weight, lower blood pressure, lower levels of something called homocysteine, and cholesterol levels that are 100 to 150 points below those of the general population. And again, this is from the Ad Seventh-day Adventist Health Study, and you can see that at every age looked at, the Seventh-day Adventists have a lower risk for heart disease. By the way, don't worry, I will make these slides um, available to uh, Tim Marie so that if anybody wants a copy, you can get them. High blood pressure, often called the silent killer, affects one in four Americans. Uh, it increases your risk for uh, heart disease, uh, what's called peripheral vascular disease, which affects our legs, and stroke. Um, risk factors for high blood pressure include, of course, uh, carrying around too much weight, uh, family history, but um, I, I just want to be clear about family history because people will say, oh, well, you know, everybody in my family has it, so of course I'm going to have it. Well, it is true that our genetics can predispose us to developing certain diseases. But as my friend uh, Dr. Michael Greger says, the reason that diseases run in families is because eating habits run in families. And um, I, the way I want you to think about this is the fact that you have lungs means that you are genetically predisposed to drowning but only if you get into water over your head. You stay out of the high-risk environment, you're gonna be good. All right, exercise, I mean, excuse me, excess alcohol will increase your blood pressure. Smoking, uh, uh, t taking in too much salt, uh, eating foods that are, uh, have a lot of high fructose corn syrup, and a lack of regular exercise, and then diets that are high in animal protein and fat. So let's look at some studies. This is a DASH study, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is a study where people were basically encouraged to eat a more plant-based diet. And they, it's not completely vegan or vegetarian. They were just asked to include uh, more plant foods in their diet. And they looked at people who had or were diagnosed with high blood pressure uh, in light blue and people who weren't uh, diagnosed with high blood pressure. And you can see that um, for both blacks and whites, the, uh, uh, when they were put on this diet, their blood pressure dropped, both the uh, systolic and diastolic numbers. Well, was it the food or was it the fact that they were just, you know, in a study? Well, this is a study that answers that question. Um, we have three groups. We have a control group that uh, stayed on the same diet throughout the uh, two periods. And then we have two other groups that um, uh, during period one, period one and two, their diet was either plant-based or meat-containing, and then they switched over. So what we see is that for the control group, they started and ended the uh, uh, study um, with the same blood pressure. Yeah, there was this transient dip, but um, uh, essentially their blood pressure for all intents and purposes did not change. Then when we look at group two, during period one, where you have the leaves, they were put on a plant-based diet and their blood pressure plummeted. As they switched over, crossed over into period two and went back to eating meat, blood pressure went right back up. Group uh, three, during uh, period one, they were on their meat-containing diet, blood pressure not much changed, but as soon as they switched to a plant-based diet, their blood pressure plummeted. So again, plant foods absolutely reduce your blood pressure. Um, and I actually already talked about the regard study, so I'm going to skip that slide and talk a little bit about protein. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about protein because everybody seems to think protein is the big issue. Protein, protein, protein. Where do you get your protein? Well, protein is important because human tissues are made out of uh, protein building blocks. And uh, what's wonderful about protein is that protein, pro amino acids can be combined in ways that can make things as different as the clear cornea over your eyes to the hair in your eyelashes or the skin uh, covering your body or the cartilage that helps your nose be flexible. Um, I mean, protein are wonderful things, but the thing, the the fundamental point I want you to understand is that proteins are building blocks. Our bodies do not use protein for energy, okay? So then the question becomes, how much protein do you need? Because if you look at the advertising on TV, the implication is, oh my God, we need tons and tons of protein. All we should be eating is protein. And that's not true because too much protein is very unhealthy. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a minute. So again, building a body is like building a home. The protein are your building materials. And so just as at, the, at this building site, um, if you are a contractor and you have a, uh, been hired to build a bunch of homes, you're going to need building materials, right? So how much building materials will you need? Obviously, that depends on whether you're building one house, five houses, correct? If you're building one house, you don't need a huge amount of building material. If you're building five houses, you need a lot more. So again, your building materials should meet the needs of your uh, building rate. So you need to deliver building materials at the rate at which they're being utilized. Why is that important? It's important because human beings are the slowest growing animals on earth. No other animal takes 20 years to reach maturity. As a result, we do not, repeat, do not, repeat, do not need high protein diets because our bodies cannot use all of that protein. Now, baby birds, by contrast, Baby birds have to hatch out of a, um, uh, an egg, grow to maturity, a full set of flight feathers, and be ready to fly south in three months. So they need a very high-protein diet, which is why they eat worms, insects, or in the case of raptors, nothing but meat, because they need a lot of protein. We do not. And in fact, when you look at human milk, which has obviously been designed to be the perfect food for baby humans, it has the lowest percentage of protein of any mammalian milk. And again, that's because human babies are very slow growing. And again, once you complete your, your building, you don't need people to keep bringing you building materials. Adult bodies do not need large amounts of protein because once an animal is mature, it only needs enough protein to fix, you know, uh, minor damages. So to replace worn out cells, uh, if you get a cut and need to replace that, but you don't need huge amounts of protein because your body can't use it. So what happens if you keep bringing in huge amounts of building material? Well, continued delivery of building material to a completed building, you end up with a pile of rubble. And an organic pile of rubble is a tumor, like this lipoma here. Or in a lot of cases, uh, we see that women will end up with uh, like uh, fibrocystic disease or uterine uh, or, uh, or tumors. And you can also end up with what I call bizarre additions like cancers. So again, animal protein has been shown to promote the development of cancers and benign tumor growths. Why, uh, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Animal protein has been linked to heart disease, as I said, cancers, development of diabetes, osteoporosis that weakens our bones, uh, prion diseases, Alzheimer's and other dementias, high blood pressure, strokes, uh, kidney failure, kidney stones, uh, dysentery and other foodborne illnesses. Uh, it's a potent cancer promoter, uh, promoter uh, putrefaction of animal protein in our colon releases toxins that have been shown to exacerbate attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, other anxiety and mood problems, 
Uh, the amino acid composition of animal protein causes high levels of something called homocysteine, which can, again, damage our blood vessels, lead to strokes and heart disease, um, and uh, has also been linked to Alzheimer's and osteoporosis. So what is it about animal protein that does this? Well, it turns out animal proteins are very, very high in what are called essential amino acids, one of which is leucine. And when our body sees large amounts of leucine, it interprets that as a growth signal. Um, uh, because leucine, high levels of leucine turn on a set of enzymes called TOR, TOR enzymes, which are growth promoting enzymes. In a baby, you want those TOR enzymes to be turned on because why? That baby is trying to grow. But in an adult human, you do not want these TOR enzymes turned on because that promotes the development of cancer. Adult cells should not be trying to grow and divide. Is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have a question about that? Because I want to make sure we're clear on that before I move on. All right. So let's look at the different amounts of leucine in different foods. So you can see all of the plant foods have certainly enough leucine to supply daily needs, but not so much that it turns on these TOR enzymes. Whereas the animal foods have many times, more than three times as much. Um, as I said, elevated leucine levels turn on these TOR oncogenes or cancer-causing genes. And the animal protein also increases levels of something called insulin-like growth factor one, which again has been shown to promote cancer development. Uh, uh, animal proteins are also high in an amino acid called methionine, which also promotes tumor growth. So looking at cancer death rates in the United States, this is from 2007, not much has changed. Uh, we see that for both men and women, leading cause is lung cancer, and of course that's uh, primarily due to smoking. It's then, number two, are the hormone-related cancers, which in women is breast cancer, and men is prostate cancer. Number three for both groups is cancer of the colon and rectum, and number four for both groups is pancreatic cancer. What's important about this is that um, breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic cancer have all been linked to diets that are high in fat and animal protein. And when we look at cancer incidence broken down by ethnic group, once again, we see that African Americans tend to have higher rates, particularly African American men. And again, that's because, once again, these uh, we're less well adapted. And in fact, um, whereas the national recommendation for getting your first screening colonoscopy is age 50 for the general population, uh, eventually it is now recommended for African Americans that we start getting screened at age 40 because we're getting colon cancers earlier than other groups. Did I see a question? Okay, so the question is, well, what about people who are doing weight training and bodybuilding? Um, uh, I, I have some pictures I can show you eventually, but um, so the, 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 and this is an important question. So if someone is trying to put on muscle mass and build body weight, do they need these higher levels of protein? Do they need the animal protein? Name an... Uh, uh, the biggest, strongest animals, land animals on this planet. Elephants, gorillas, giraffes, rhinos, hippos, cows, uh, buffalo, they're all strict plant eaters. We absolutely do not need animal protein to put on muscle mass. And when we got ready to build Western civilization, we did not hook our plows to lions, tigers, and bears. We hooked them up to oxen and horses. It was the plant eaters because only they have the strength and the stamina to do the kind of work that we needed. So the bottom line is no, 
even bodybuilders, when they've done nitrogen balance studies on these guys, um, what they find, what they show is that all, most of that excess protein that they're eating is coming out in their urine. They can't utilize it because you can only use a certain amount of protein on a daily basis in terms of uh, muscle building and eating. Uh, our bodies don't store protein, so everything we, need, we consume in excess of what we actually use is converted to carbohydrate, and the nitrogen, uh, which is what makes protein protein, is, uh, comes out in the urine. So, no, you don't need it. Uh, and this is cancer mortality, similar stats. We'll just move. Move right ahead. Um, this is a slide showing uh, breast cancer intake by country. When you look at uh, countries where they have very low uh, uh, per capita fat intake, very low rates of breast cancer, but if a woman uh, or family in Japan where they have a diet that's traditionally low in fat migrates to the United States or New Zealand where they have a much higher fat diet, you see that the cancer rate skyrockets and becomes commensurate with the general population. So again, it's not the location, it's not the genetics, it's what people are eating. And we see a very similar curve <clears throat> for uh, uh, breast cancer and animal food intake. Again, where people are eating a largely plant-based diet, they have a very low rate of breast cancer, but as they start to eat more and more animal food, the rate of breast cancer skyrockets. Uh, this is colorectal uh, uh, cancer rates in the uh, less developed countries where they have a plant-based diet versus the more developed countries both for both men and women. Again, three times, uh, two to three times uh, the rate where people are eating uh, more meat. This looks at red meat and uh, colon cancer. Using people who never eat it or rarely eat it as a baseline, you can see for both men and women, you have two and a half to three and a half times the rates as people start to eat more meat. And this looks at uh, colon cancer as an index of daily meat consumption. As people eat more and more meat on a per capita basis, the incidence of colon cancer skyrockets. Uh, breast, prostate, pancreatic, and colon cancers have all been shown to be increased by diets that are high in fat, animal protein, and uh, uh, simultaneously low in fruit, grains, vegetables. Um, diets that are high in saturated fat, trans fat, and red meat are especially problematic. And again, these cancers do strike African Americans to a disproportionate degree and with greater lethality. Five-year breast cancer survival rates for African American women are 69% compared to 84% for Caucasian women. African American men have a 60% higher rate of prostate cancer than Caucasian men. And once we develop it, we are more than twice as likely to die from it uh, relative to white men. Um, uh, prostate cancer is very lethal for African American men. Um, my mom named me after her one and only brother, and my uncle died from metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, pancreatic cancer, which is what Aretha Franklin died from, uh, incidence rates are uh, skyrocketing. They're 27 and 40 percent higher for African American men and women, respectively, compared to uh, Caucasian men and women, and mortality rates are 29 and 38 percent higher. So again, given this lethality with, uh, uh, with cancer as with heart disease, ounce prevention is worth a ton of cure. So, quick question, you got milk? Because if you do, you just might have some problems. Now, uh, milk, okay. Milk is usually, uh, and, uh, we're encouraged to eat milk because, or drink uh, uh, products made from cow's milk because people say, well, you need it for calcium. Well, no, you don't. Cows don't drink milk, but there's plenty of calcium in there. Milk, where do they get it? From green leafy uh, plants. And again, when you think about what milk is, milk is a food that is designed to stimulate growth and stimulate immune function. And I just wanted to show you guys this slide really quickly so that, remember what I was talking about, uh, rapid growth rates, you need a lot more protein. So you see the carnivores, which have very small, tiny babies that grow really quickly, have much higher protein, much higher fat than the two plant eaters down at the bottom. But even when you look at protein uh, content of cows versus humans, the cows have three times, almost three times the amount of protein, and that's because calves grow much faster than baby humans. But the humans, uh, human milk has much more sugar than uh, cow's milk, and that's because proportionately uh, human babies have much bigger brains. So anyway, um, I've been told that unfortunately, 
I have run out of time, um, which I hate, folks. But like I said, I'm going to make these slides available to Tim Marie. Um, and uh, let me, I just want, let me just show you guys this one real quick. Um, this is just showing um, Alzheimer's disease as a function of meat consumption. And once again, you see in places where people eat a lot of animal food, you have very high rates of dementia. So again, dementia is a skyrocketing problem in the United States and other Western countries. And if you want to decrease your risk for uh, dementia, uh, cut the meat out. And so in closing, let me just leave you with these thoughts. Um, it can be argued that the greatest successes in the history of modern medicine have always been due to preventive rather than uh, curative methods. If you calculate total life years saved by uh, the various medical modalities, the years saved through preventive techniques would um, markedly exceed those from the medicines and surgical procedures that we use. There's no question that you know surgery, antibiotics, chemotherapy, and so forth are important, but there's also no question that the vast majority of the disease and death we see in the United States and other Western countries is due to the way we eat and live. Given the incalculable suffering and loss of life precipitated by these diseases and the costs associated uh, with treating them, it's absolutely essential that we uh, uh, change our diets in order to prevent what is preventable. Remember, nobody, nobody ever asked for fried chicken, ice cream, french fries, or pork chop in the delivery room. Everything we think we like, somebody taught us to like. And just like we learn to like unhealthy foods, we can learn to like things that are actually good for us. We have to reject the idea that the things that are pleasurable in life are necessarily those that are either destructive to our health or destructive to the environment or that require us to be brutal and cruel to another living creature. Pleasure itself is neutral. We can and must learn to derive pleasure and happiness from those things that protect and affirm our lives and preserve the planet for our children. Thank you, guys.